right, so I've been spending the past few months now working on uh, expected threat. You might have seen some version of it on, on Twitter or elsewhere. Um, but today I want to uh, sort of tease it apart a little bit more and also look at some more practical applications that you yourself in your, in your club or uh, in your organization can actually implement in a, in a very straightforward way and, and start making use of XD in the short term. So I want to start with a few clips of Alexander Zinchenko. Um, he deputized a left back for Manchester City for part of last season. Uh, one thing to note about him is that he was originally a winger before he came to Manchester City, and he was sort of converted uh, because Man City was short of a left back. And so he has a very attacking mindset, and we can see these in, in a few clips of his. So here he is passing to Sani, this wonderful through ball in, and Sani goes on to finish, finish the move off. Here he is putting an early cross in for Aguero, who also finishes it off here. And then this is a, a nice low cross into Sterling. Actually misses a couple of people. Sterling is fortunate enough to get to it and finishes it off. So what's common about these three is that if you look at them today, you would call them assists. And we have a very good, uh, well-defined terminology for this. An assist is, is any, any pass that results in a goal in the next action, or the, the player who receives it uh, goes on to score without making any subsequent passes. And so this is well defined, and you know, we see these pretty much everywhere. But there's a second category of Zinchenko movements that aren't quite covered by assists, but are still quite valuable. So here he is setting up Mares, I believe, and Mares can't quite execute the shot properly on this occasion. Here he is, again, an early cross, just like the one above there, but in this case, his, his teammate can't quite uh, get to the end of it. And here's another one, putting a cross in. Once again, the header doesn't have too much power behind it. But the important point here is that all three of these on another day might have been assists. It's just that in, on this occasion, because of factors beyond Zinchenko's control, they weren't actually goals. And so he doesn't get credited with assists. So assists is. It's a very noisy metric in that you're dependent on what other people are doing. You're dependent on the goalkeeper's position and their decision making and, and all these other things. And so this problem is solved <laughs> partly by expected assists. This is a more probabilistic approach that says assists are noisy and we're going to take that noise away and say we're going to reward Zinchenko uh, even if he played a pass that should have been assist but it, it wasn't an assist on that particular uh, day. And so expected assist has us covered over there. Well, there's a third category of passes that isn't quite covered by expected assist or assist. So here Zinchenko is, is playing this long diagonal ball across. It really opens up a lot of space on the right wing and sure that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite lead to a shot in the immediate next action, but it does open up a lot of space uh, for the winger to then go on and then set up a striker. So it is a valuable action, but it doesn't have high expected assists. It doesn't lead to a good shooting position immediately. This is a very similar ball, again, to the right wing, and it really sets up the rest of the play for, for, something, uh, for something promising. And this is a very similar ball to the one in the, the top left. This time it goes to Sterling. He's a little narrower than, than Sane was, and so he doesn't take a shot. He tries to square it. It doesn't lead to a goal. So Zinchenko doesn't get an assist, doesn't get a pre-assist uh, or a secondary assist. And it's not also a high expected assist because Sterling is narrow when he receives the ball. He's not in a good shooting position necessarily. And so the expected assist of Zinchenko's pass isn't that much. And so this category of Zinchenko actions isn't really looked at by any of our existing metrics today. When you're looking at build-up play, these kinds of actions all our metrics are, are completely blind to these, and that seems a little wrong. And so the question becomes, how do we actually capture the value of these actions, and, and how can we reward players like Zinchenko for doing things like these? As, as proof of uh, sort of why Zinchenko, uh, Zinchenko is, over, is undervalued, according to these metrics, you can see in the Premier League last season, uh, he ranked 99th in expected assists per 90 minutes. Uh, and that is very surprising for a few reasons. Firstly, he played in the team that scored the most number of goals. You wouldn't really expect him to be higher than that. And second, we've just seen all these clips of him. He is a very attacking wing back. And so something is, is broken over there. And there's an analogy that I like with chess. And it's borrowed from a 2014 paper that actually came from basketball uh, by Luke Bourne. 
and it, it goes as follows. You have some metrics that are so focused on the end outcome, such as assists and expected assists. It's as though you're analyzing a chess match just based on the last move that resulted in checkmate. Uh, and it, these metrics are, are blind to the possibility that the crucial move that set you up for checkmate might have come a few moves before. That's usually the case in chess and in football as well. More often than not, you, you'll notice that it's not just that final assist that, that matters. It's everything that came before it in the buildup. And so we need a metric that doesn't just look at checkmate, but looks a little bit beyond checkmate and, and looks at what happened to set you up for that assist. Zinchenko is not alone in this. He has a lot of the category three actions, but there are a lot of other players just in the Premier League. Uh, Kieran Trippier is one of them, of course, no longer in the Premier League, but here he is beating a man in midfield and basically carrying the ball all the way from the halfway line uh, into the box, setting up Dele Alli. I believe on this occasion, uh, Dele Alli couldn't quite uh, finish it off. He was, he was tackled over there. On another day, that might have led to an assist, but in this case, our current metrics don't, don't really value that action from Trippier of carrying the ball all the way through. Alex Awobi is another one. Um, I'm an Arsenal supporter, and I was, I was really sad when he left for Everton because he always ranks very, very highly on XD. And he is really good at, at breaking, this, uh, breaking the defense by, by playing those kinds of passes. He takes on a lot of defenders uh, on the wing. And just in general, he, I believe he ranked second or third uh, expected threat uh, per 90 minutes last season in the Premier League. So here he is setting up Kolasinac. Kolasinac uh, squares the ball for Aubameyang, who can't quite finish. But it will be sparse here. You can see that our current metrics, it won't really show up anywhere, that particular pass, whereas it's actually very valuable. And here's a few more examples. And there's actually many more, but these are some of the more uh, notable ones in the Premier League. So what ties these three actions together is the fact that all of them increase the likelihood of their team scoring in that particular possession. So when Trippier carries the ball from the halfway line all the way into the box and sets up Dele Alli, what he's doing intrinsically is increasing the likelihood of Spurs scoring in that possession. It will be doing the same with that pass that uh, takes out effectively three defenders from the game. And uh, Zinchenko, we saw earlier, doing, doing a similar thing there. And so that exactly is what expected threat is trying to capture. It's trying to answer the question, for a given particular action, how much did the likelihood of scoring in that current possession change? Whether positively or negatively, expected threat is just going to model the likelihood. And then we can figure out for each action how much did the XD change by. And then we can start to value these player actions. So before diving into uh, how exactly the model works. It, there's this analogy with uh, cities and why locations are valuable that I like. And I was thinking about this when I actually came up with the formulation for it. So uh, I think it's important to share this. And this is a, a map of Boston. So it's a little random, but the analogy works especially well with Boston. So the map of Boston is, is there. And overlaid on it, you have a couple of things. So first, you have these transit lines. So you can see the subway. Uh, lines and with the subway stops along them. Uh, this extends not just from the center of Boston, but also into all the suburbs. And then you have this heat map also overlaid on top of this, and this shows uh, the amount that you would pay per bedroom. So it's, it's just a, a proxy for how valuable is that location if you're buying a house or renting, a, renting an apartment. And so the interesting thing is you, you can look at this and ask what makes a location valuable. So one thing for sure that makes a location valuable is if it's in the center of the city, if it's in the center of Boston over there, it doesn't matter where exactly you are. You are in a valuable location. You're close to everything. And you're going to pay a premium uh, no matter what. But something interesting happens in the suburbs. So if you follow the red line going uh, to the northwest over there, you can see that close to the subway line, you're going to pay much higher than you would a little bit away from it. And, and this is true. Uh, quite consistently along the red line and also along the orange line that goes north over there. And so a location can be valuable in a city for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it might be in a prime location itself, so it might be in the center of the city, but it can also be valuable if it provides you easy access to the center of the city or to other valuable locations. And so how does this map over to football? Well, the same thing applies in football. There are some locations on the pitch that are inherently valuable because you can shoot from there and score very easily. That's the center of the city. 
But there's also other locations that are valuable that we don't think about as much, which let you go to the center of the box very easily. And so that's sort of your suburbs that have well-connected transit. You might be playing on the wings, and that, that is actually a really good position that has a lot of value. Even though you can't shoot directly from there, you can use that position to then transition to some other location that provides you a good shot. And so when coming up with the model uh, for expected threat, it's, uh, it's convenient to think about it as, as though you are a player at some particular location. So we've divided the pitch up into this, uh, this grid, and then there's an orange box over there. So imagine that you are a player standing over there, and you have the ball at your feet. Now, in our simplified model, we're going to say that at this point, you can do one of two things. Firstly, you always have the option to shoot. Wherever you are, you can take a shot, um, and that, that's always an option that you can take. But there's a second option that we introduce, and that is the, the possibility of moving the ball. So moving the ball over here is defined as not just passing the ball, but also potentially carrying the ball or, or dribbling it to another location. So you are somewhere, you have two options uh, every time you have to make this decision. Do you shoot or do you move? And further, if you move, there's many other decisions to make. So where exactly do you move? Do you move to uh, the top left location? Do you move to 0, 01? Do you move to 0, 02? And you can do this for all 96. In this case, we, we have 96 zones. You can do this for all, all of those zones. So really, at every instant, a player has... Uh, 97 decisions to make, so the first decision that they can take is to shoot, but the second decision is to choose to move to any of the other 96 zones. Now, what we can do is, based on historical data that we have, just pure event data, we can actually divide up the grid and, and look at, look at uh, historical events. How often did players undertake uh, each, of these, each of these possibilities? So, you can, just based on simple counts, you can say that when a player was in that orange location, they chose to take a shot 8.2% uh, of the time. They chose to move to so-and-so location 1% of the time. And, and you can do that for all your possible outcomes. So that's step one. The second step is to look at, once that decision was made, how many of those uh, executed actions were actually successful? How many of them were completed? And in the case of uh, shots, how many of them turned to goals? And so, again, this is just based on frequency. So we can look at all the, all the times that a particular decision was made and look at how many of them were successful, how many of them were unsuccessful. Uh, so in this case, we see that if you choose to shoot from that orange zone, which itself is a decision taken 8.2% of the time, then your, your probability of scoring is something like 1.6%. And then finally, we have uh, a term for reward. So we're trying to model... What is, what is exactly the reward if you execute a particular action successfully? So you, you make a decision, you execute it, and let's say you execute it successfully, what is the, the reward that you get out of it? So the easy case is if you choose to shoot. So if you shoot and you're successful, that means you scored a goal. And so what we're going to say is that the reward that you get in that case is just one because you've added one goal to your team. In the case of moving to another location, it's more complicated because you're not scoring immediately. But what we can do now is sort of define this recursively. We can say that if you move to location 0, 0, the reward that you get out of it is now the xt at 0, 0, because your likelihood of scoring from 0, 0 is defined as the xt at 0, 0. And so for each of those boxes in that grid, you can start to come up with equations that define the xt at that location in terms of the xt's at all other locations. Now, there's, there's actually there, there's, uh, this equation that really we have to solve for. So for one particular location, the xt is just the product of all three of these terms. So you, you choose some particular outcome, you then execute it successfully, and then you get some reward out of it. All three of these things need to happen together, and that defines your total reward for that particular location. Now, there's actually two ways of, of solving for this. Uh, one is a, a boring and also more principled way, which I, I don't mention uh, as often as, as the second one. Uh, the more boring way is to turn this into a linear system of equations, which is quite easy to do if you move all the terms around. Uh, the xt at any given location is just a linear equation in the xt of all other locations. And so you can throw it into a matrix, 
um, and solve it with any linear algebra solver, and it, it's pretty straightforward to do, and you get very precise values out of it. Um, but the second method is actually more interesting, it's more interpretable, and uh, it, it might not give you exactly the correct values, but over time it actually converges to the, the same uh, values that you would get using the first approach. And the approach there is as follows. So we start by saying we're going to do this step by step. At step zero, we know nothing about the xt at any location. So the xt everywhere is just zero. So over here, when this loops back, you'll see at iteration zero, everything is flat. It's just a, a flat map there. And so now what we say is that we're going to have this concept of a budget. So imagine that you're a player, and I tell you that you have the ball at some location. You have a budget of three actions to score. Now, you have to figure out a way of taking up only three actions. So you can pass the ball, pass the ball again, then shoot. Or you can choose to shoot directly. Or you can choose to pass and then shoot. All of those things are under the budget of three actions. It's, it's up to you to choose how you want to use those three actions if you want to use all of them. But the point is you have some budget. And so we can start increasing this budget step by step. We can say, well, first, what happens if you just have a budget of one action and you're at some particular location? Well, if you have a budget of one action, the only thing you can do to score is shoot and nothing else. There's no point in moving the ball. Then you're out of your budget and uh, you didn't score. So at iteration one, the map that you get, is a, it, it's modeling that. So it's, it's modeling the probability that if you just had to shoot, would you score or not? And as you get into future iterations, you're factoring in more, more of a budget. So at iteration two, you're accounting for the possibility that you can move once and then shoot. And at iteration three, you can move twice and then shoot. And so eventually, once you run this for multiple iterations, it starts to converge to a particular map. And uh, this sort of speaks to the fact that most possessions will, will end in a goal or, or not within some number of actions. It's not unlimited. Um, moving the ball around you know, 100 times doesn't have increased value over moving it 50 times. So you can start computing this for specific subsets of data, which is, I think, where it gets uh, quite powerful. And uh, going back to, to 23 Sports talk earlier today, uh, where they did that for attacking against a set defense versus not, it's, it's the same idea here. So here you can take all of the actions from the Premier League for one particular season, and this is the expected threat map that you get out of it. And you can do this across leagues. By the way, this is a, a theme that will come up all, all the time in this talk. I'm going to show vis visualization for England, and I'll show it for all other leagues. And I'm going to skip through them um, in the interest of time, but we'll make the slides available in case you want to take a closer look. What's even more powerful, though, is looking at it at a particular club level. So each club has its own style, naturally. And Arsenal's style, for example, is, is very different from Bournemouth's style, and that is very different from Brighton's style. And this gets at the fact that different teams value possession in different areas of the pitch. And this is purely down to their tactics. So you can look at all these different teams, and they, they largely have the same shape. Naturally, everyone values possession closer to the goal, but there are subtle differences here and there. Some teams are more dangerous on the wing. Some teams are more dangerous through the middle. Uh, some teams are just more clinical than others. So if you look at someone like Liverpool, uh, they have a very high peak there. And that's just because they're inherently very, very dangerous, uh, even in front of goal, as compared to one of the lower teams. Now, this itself isn't, isn't very useful. Uh, we, can, we can look in multiple leagues. We don't get too much out of this itself. But we can start to use this, these XT maps to actually understand something uh, deeper about team style. So in a way, these maps are encapsulating what, what parts of the pitch does a particular team value more than others. And so one way of, of visualizing this is you take all of these maps across Europe from a particular season, and we're going to use principal component analysis just for visualization purposes to bring it down to three dimensions, to something we can actually play around with. And so for every club, we're going to reduce their XT map into three dimensions. So we have an X, a Y, and a Z for every team. Uh, you can throw all of those points into a, a 3D visualizer that visualizes these, these points. And you can, start to see, um, you can start to see what teams are similar in that particular three-dimensional space. So you can see that Arsenal's XT map, for example, is, is very close to Dortmund's XT map. And you can do this across Europe. So you can start to see cross-league. Uh, similarities between teams. And one of the applications of that is, let's say you're playing in the Europa League, Arsenal's playing Eintracht Frankfurt, 
uh, they don't know much about them. And, and so one way of, of making use of this is looking at XD maps from, from Frankfurt, looking at who they map closely to in England, who, who is Arsenal, uh, an opposition that Arsenal might have played previously and is more familiar with. And so you can start to get a sense of who might you want to take a look at before playing someone who you've never seen before using just XD maps. Now, stepping away from, from team style, the, the powerful thing also about XT is that it's just dependent on ball location. So you, you give any ball location just an X and a Y, and you can evaluate the expected threat at that location. So that means you can start to take tracking data like this, and you can evaluate the XT at every frame. So you can see it's something like 2% starting out in midfield. Ball goes across, increases to about 4%. And then as it makes its way into the box uh, towards the striker, it rises to about 20%. And now coming back to Zinchenko, how do we answer the question of valuing his actions? So that is the same pass to Sterling. Here's the start location, which is where Zinchenko received the ball. And then that on the right is where Sterling received the ball. So Zinchenko effectively moved the ball from this location on the left to that location on the right. And so keeping in mind that we can evaluate XT at any location on the pitch, we can evaluate the XT at location A over there and also at location B. And we see that Zinchenko's pass increased Manchester City's chances of scoring in that possession from 2.9% to 6.1%. And so now you can subtract those two and say that Zinchenko's pass added something like 3.2% uh, to Manchester City's chances of scoring in that possession. And we, we add that to his XD created total. Now, once you have that framework in place, you can start to accumulate all the actions of a particular team over a season and ask the question, when they create that XD, where does it come from? So you're looking at uh, where does that pass come from that really breaks that opposition defense? Where do, that pl where do they play that really, really good ball that opens up the defense and, and sets up the opportunity? And so you can do this on a per team basis. I think uh, some of the the more interesting ones, Manchester City is always interesting. You can almost see that the kind of ball that Zinchenko plays over there and through the lines and, and to Sterling and Sani on the left. Again, you can do this across leagues and you can take a look at these uh, once the slides are available. And another powerful thing about XT is because you can calculate it on any subset of events, you can actually flip the problem and look at it from a defensive standpoint. So you can ask, I don't want to know about how Arsenal attack, but I want to know about how teams attack against Arsenal. So you take all the events that were recorded by opposition against a particular team, and you can start to build XD maps on that, and you can start to see where did opposition create XD from. I think there's a couple of interesting ones here. Liverpool over there, uh, highly susceptible on their right-hand side of defense, partly probably because of Alexander Arnold uh, usually high up the pitch and uh, leaving space behind. Uh, Tottenham is, is another good example on the bottom left, uh, very one-sided. Uh, there's, there's one specific side of their defense that you should be targeting. And again, across leagues. Another application of XT is once you have this framework of evaluating passes, you can go back to our original passing networks. And so we saw a few of these in the previous talk. On the, on the left, when the bar is at completely unweighted, you see a passing network that is sort of the traditional passing network, where the, the weights <coughs> of the edges, the thickness, just corresponds to the number of passes played. But what you can do is you can start to weight each pass by the amount of XT it added. And as you move the bar to the right, you see that different connections start to get highlighted. So in this case, you see that uh, I believe Trippier to uh, Sterling was a highly valuable connection in that sense. That pair created a lot of XT uh, in that particular direction. And original passing networks, the, the classic passing networks, don't quite give you that. They just give you a sense of where were the most passes played, but you can start to use XT to figure out where was, actual, where was the actual danger created uh, by this team in this match. Now, you can start to do this also over the course of a season across the league. So this is looking at the Premier League. I apologize if the text is a little small, but I'll, I'll point out some, some interesting things here. So on the x-axis is XT created per 90 minutes, and on the y-axis is XT received per 90 minutes. So it's, it's also important to acknowledge uh, the people who are getting on the ends of these really creative passes. So Sterling, in that example, is making a really good run, and we want to be able to recognize that as well as uh, Zinchenko, who played the pass. 
And so this plots both of those, those things along the x and y axis. Uh, the diagonal line is just uh, sort of dividing this into two. So players below the diagonal, they create more xt than they receive, and then players above the diagonal receive more than they create. And this is just, it speaks to different roles within a team. So Olivia Giroux is up top on XT receive per 90 minutes. Uh, Gabriel Jesus is there as well. And on the right-hand side, uh, there's Hazard, De Bruyne, Mahrez, it will be, and players of that light. And you also see uh, Liverpool's wing backs all clustered together in the bottom right. So you can, uh, it's also interesting to break this down by, by saying, let's look at everyone outside the top six, because the top six usually tends to dominate these kinds of metrics. You see some interesting things here. I think one of the more interesting parts of this particular uh, graph is you almost see these partnerships across the diagonal. So you can see uh, Dio Lefeo on the right. And then if you look almost across the diagonal, you'll start to see Troy Deeney over there. And it turns out that a lot of passes did go between them. That's how the threat was created and received. And you, you see that in a few other instances here, too. You can do this for, for other leagues. So Lewandowski is up top over there. Uh, Sancho on the right. Uh, as you might expect, Messi changes the dimensions of the graph itself. And uh, Suarez is up top. Uh, Neymar over here doing similar things that Messi was doing uh, previously. And, and Italy is always an interesting one. Um, one thing to note is that Ronaldo actually it doesn't rank that highly. He's somewhere in the middle over there on uh, XD created and XD uh, received, which is something to, to look at. Now, you can go back to expected assists, which we mentioned earlier, and you can ask, how does XD compare to expected assists? Now, expected uh, threat is not exclusively better than expected assists. They're making different assumptions, in a sense. Expected assist is answering a very specific question. XT is answering sort of a more general question, but they can be used together. So this is an example of all the players from the Premier League plotted with their expected assist per 90 minutes on the y-axis, and then their XT created on the x-axis. Also, for a fairer comparison, the XT created here is only through passes and not carries, mostly because expected assists are also here evaluated only on passes. So it's just an apples to apples comparison. And so the diagonal line here, it, it's no longer truly the diagonal. It's a regression line. And this is sort of showing you uh, the average ratio of the expected assists and expected threat that a player creates. And so this really uh, divides the players into two. There's, there's some players who are making a lot of good expected assist passes in that they're setting up the final shot. And so you can see Sanchez, Sane, uh, David Silva, Sterling up top over there. But then there's a few players below who we don't really think about as, as setting up assists too often, but they're actually quite instrumental in, in setting up threat that leads to those assists. So you see all the, the Liverpool uh, wingbacks again. And then Zinchenko actually ranks, uh, I believe, 25th on uh, unexpected threat uh, per 90, as opposed to 99th unexpected assists. Once again, you can do this across leagues. <laughs> Messi again. And, uh, and yeah, th this gives you a, a sense of what players are really good at that final ball and which players may not be good at that final ball but are really good in, in something that precedes that final ball. Now, another application of XT is a more recent one. And this is sort of revisiting XG timeline. So we're all probably very familiar with these by now. This is just plotting for one particular game, in this case, Juventus versus Napoli, which is a crazy roller coaster of a game. Um, what was running XG at every, every point in time. Now, XG is great, but one of the disadvantages is that you can only evaluate it for, for shots that were taken. And usually in a game, there aren't those many shots. There's always a lot of stuff happening, but not all possessions lead to shots. It's a small amount. And so the disadvantage of, I will come back to that, um, the disadvantage of, of XG timelines is if you look at a period like this, at the bottom is the XG timeline. You can see that for, for Juventus, for that big period, it's almost completely flat. It doesn't really tell you about what they were doing during that period. And for, for Napoli as well, it's relatively flat. They took a few shots. Nothing was promising. But it, it doesn't tell you much. And so what you can do is you can start to take expected threat now. And the advantage here is that you don't need shots. You don't need any, uh, any particular event to happen. You can evaluate it at every location at every point in time. So you can go back to your match and look at every possession 
and look at what is the XT during each possession. And you sum those up for every team, and you evaluate it over a rolling window of a few minutes. And you actually get this really nice graph of who was controlling the game, who was getting into more threatening areas at which uh, points in the game, and how did that momentum flow uh, as different events happen. And so this is a comparison of the XT timeline up there and the XG timeline below. And these are a few periods to highlight. So this is, again, the relatively flat period between Juventus' uh, second goal and Napoli's first goal, where XG doesn't tell us all that much, apart from the fact that Juventus had two good shots. Uh, but the XT timeline really tells us that the momentum was sort of swinging in Napoli's favor, and their goal was kind of coming. Uh, they had a big period of dominance in the middle there. This is another period between, I believe, Napoli's second and third goals. They didn't take any shots between their second and third goal, but you can see that on the XT timeline, they were getting into lots of threatening areas. So this gives you a lot more information. And then finally, after Napoli equalized, they brought back to 3-3 after being down 3-0. Uh, they just sat back, and XT tells you that pretty clearly. Juventus had all the threat going in, in their favor, and XG doesn't really tell you all that much. It just tells you that the goal eventually came for Juventus. Um, there was a talk earlier today about using uh, sort of a, a derivative of XT to figure out how you can break down a set defense. So I recommend uh, watching that later if you didn't catch it. That's another application of XT, and it, it really speaks to the fact that you can use XT, this, this general method, on any subset of actions, on, on any uh, particular problem, as long as you have the right data. One really cool thing that I, I found out recently is that people have been mapping over expected threat for ice hockey, so the sport logic over in Canada, and, and they recently built uh, the same kind of model they have one difference where they sort of build a different model for passes and carries because apparently they're very different in ice hockey functionally. Uh, I also learned that you can, you can pass from behind the goal and supposedly it's very valuable in ice hockey. And so this is showing the XT map for passes and carries on, on the left for the whole league. And then on the right is sort of the XT created map that we saw earlier. And that's showing you for one particular player, where do they create XT from? Uh, later on today, there's going to be a talk by Robert Hickman. I highly recommend uh, you be here for that. And that's looking at this problem of expected threat today as is, is only really taking into account reward, but not really risk. And so his talk is going to be all about how do we start factoring in risk as well and get a more complete picture of, of how we should value player actions. Now, Looking further beyond, what is the next step for expected threat? I think one of the promising things to look at is how do we extend this to tracking data once, once we have it in, in good volumes? So this is one particular example. This is Ajax scoring a goal against PSV a couple of months ago. So just take a look at it a couple of times. Really good goal. Um, here is a, a tracking data view of it on the top left. Uh, this is Kotsi of uh, Ricardo Tavares, by the way, uh, last row view, as you might have seen him on Twitter. And so there's, there's actually something very subtle that happens in this sequence that is important to capture. So in the middle now, you, you see uh, about a second where uh, the defender, I believe it's Weltman, he doesn't really have a passing option to begin with, but he drags the ball back by a meter, and then that space opens up uh, through the middle for him. Uh, to play Van der Beek in. And so while that is happening, Tadic over there is making the run across to, to the byline, and that's actually dragging a defender out of position. So you can see that in, uh, this is frame one, where, where they begin, there's no real passing options, and then on the right, there's all that space that has opened up for Van der Beek to run into. Now, what you can do is, you can start to look at these frames independently and, and fit a Voronoi diagram on them, so you can say, in these particular frames, what parts of the pitch approximately were controlled by each team, or which player was closest to each point on the pitch. And you can start to integrate the XT covered by all the locations controlled by the attacking team. So in this case, the areas controlled by Ajax, the attacking team, are the lighter areas. So you can see that in that one second, um, even though Veltman himself is not moving the ball anywhere significant, just by virtue of other players' movement, Tadic dragging the defender across, there's a lot of extra space now covered by uh, Van der Beek in the Warnoy diagram. And that has a lot of XT value. So if you integrate the XT value of all those uh, lighter areas, 
you can start to, to build this, uh, this plot of how does the XT control by a particular team change over a tracking sequence. And so in this case, you can see in that particular second, the XT control uh, or the threat potential, as uh, Ricardo calls it, increases significantly. Whereas the current XT version based on event data would actually tell us nothing. It would, it, it would say that the ball was, was moved back by a meter, XT wasn't really affected. And so this is one of the more promising directions that uh, we might want to look at in the future as, as further, further work. Um, and there's also other possible approaches to extending this to tracking data. I want to end with something that actually has nothing to do with XT. It's, it's a byproduct of the way XT is computed, and I just sort of stumbled upon it. Uh, when I was working on XT. And so if you think back to the way we modeled it, we, we said that a player always has two decisions to make. Either uh, the player can shoot or the player can choose to move the ball to any other location. Now, once you have this information about how players move the ball when they have it in a certain location, it's actually very rich information. It, you can think about it as a four-dimensional passing network, in a sense. It tells you from location X to location Y uh, what is the likelihood of moving it there, and, and how successful are you when you choose to do that? And that's actually very rich information, encodes a lot about team style. And so there's actually a way of visualizing that four-dimensional passing network, and it goes as follows. So this is inspired by random walks and in Markov models, uh, if you're familiar with that. And so what we're doing is we're saying, let's imagine that this particular team has the ball in in their defensive third, so close to their box, this is really just the probability of the ball being in those locations. So right now, in the first frame, the, the ball is going to be somewhere in that location. And we set this up as an initialization. Now what we can do is we can take that transition matrix, the one that's telling us when they're here, they go there. And we can multiply it with this probability distribution. And so you do that once, you get this. This, I believe, is, is for the entire Premier League. So you can see that when uh, defenses have the ball in, in that uh, defensive third, the next thing they, they usually do is pass it to one of the two center backs. So there's also sort of distributions along the wings, which, which makes sense. And the powerful thing here is you can do this iteratively. So one more iteration and another one. And you can probably see where this is going. You can stitch these together and get a very good sense of how is the ball moved by a particular team across the pitch. So this gives you a sense of what channels do they use. Do they build down the wings? Do they tend to be a little more central? Are they quick? Are they a little more, more careful with their build-up? And further, it doesn't have to be just a defensive third. You can ask the question, what if a team had the ball in that area? What if their right back had it uh, near the corner flag? What do they do next? And you can do exactly the same thing. So in some cases, they will continue further down the right wing. And in other cases, they'll sort of switch play through midfield and, and attack down the left. And again, you can do this for all particular teams in the league. I think one of the interesting ones, uh, though there's a few. I, I think there's some of the counter-attacking ones are always interesting. Uh, Burnley is, is very quick to get to goal. They just can't wait. Uh, Brighton, as well, is, is one of those. And, Manchester City, you can again see those, uh, those balls uh, in those passing lanes. And again, going with the, the theme from before, you can do this for opposition too. You can ask, where did teams who were playing a certain team build up play from? And that again gives you a sense of what are the build up channels that you might look to exploit when you're playing a certain opposition. And again, you can see Liverpool, who we highlighted earlier, again, susceptible down that uh, right hand side of defense. All right, that is all I have. So I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'll be hanging around regardless all day. So yeah, I think we're, we're a little bit over there. Thanks very much, Thanks.